Hi everyone, it's Elise from Kid and Clatter Coloring Classes and I have some exciting news to share with you today. I've partnered up with Couture Creations to create a new line of beautiful vintage floral stamps for you to color. The line is called Stamp and Color and I wanted to focus on beautiful intricate florals where you can show off your coloring and use on your cards, mixed media or crafting projects or even just frame up to put on display. There are five stamps in the set focusing on a feature floral. Each stamp also has vintage extras like keys, flourishes, postage stamps, text and more little goodies that you can use on your projects. To celebrate the new release, I wanted to do a mini beginner's art lesson on colouring one of my favourite stamps from the new range and we're going to be colouring up our little tulips here today. So the tulips are one of my favourite because we've got such beautiful big florals to play with all of our colouring techniques. In line with the new stamp release, Couture Creations have also released a new set of ink pads that are alcohol marker safe. I've got a black, also a beautiful soft grey, and even the light pink, which are great for your no lines colouring. For those of you just starting out with colouring, no lines is when we print or stamp the image in a light grey or even more of an earthy skin colour. So when you do your colouring, you don't get those harsh black outline edges. This can help your images to look more realistic and works great with your nature images. I'll also be using the brand new Couture Creations alcohol markers today in this video. These are a new marker range that is available and is a good affordable option for those who can't afford the more high-end markers. I'll be doing a comparison review video shortly to explain some of the features and differences for you, but please don't hesitate to reach out if you do have any questions. If you already own a different brand of alcohol markers, you can still follow along with this lesson and I'll pop some of the color blends for more popular brands in the description of the video here. So are you ready to get started? Our coloring classes at Kid and Clatter are all about teaching real art fundamentals and breaking everything down to beginner basics. So if you are new to coloring, this is going to be a great lesson for you to start learning how to create depth and dimension in your projects. If you've been coloring for a while, this is still going to be a great lesson to help explain some of the more intricate detailing theories to help you level up. Just remember that a lesson is to help you grow, so we may be tackling some new techniques here today for you which can feel a little bit challenging, but this is a great thing. It means we've identified some areas you can practice to help you level up, and as long as you have a go, you're growing and improving regardless of your end result. Now, before we color, one of the most important things we need to learn about is called light source. A light source is anything in our scenes that create light. It's important because without light, we cannot see and objects won't have any depth or definition. Now, in our classes, we typically work with ambient lighting, which is a major source of light in a scene like the sun or overhead lights, which cast big cones of light over your entire project rather than just coming from one direction. This is generally the most flattering form of light. Now, the way that we approach adding lighting in our coloring is that every part of the image that is popping up or out toward those light rays is going to be hit first. So they're going to be the lightest and brightest parts of the object. And we call these our highlights. Now, the parts of the object that are slanting or curving away from the light or just further back are called the shadows. And these are the darkest parts of the image. Now between highlight and shadow, we have our midtone. This is considered the true color of the object as it's not affected by light or shade. Now one more lighting theory that is very important to help you achieve depth is the cast shadow. When we have something sitting in front or above something else, it casts a shadow back onto the object below or behind. So see that shadow on my hand there? That's the cast shadow. It's cast by the brush here on top of my hand. Now the closer these objects are together, the darker and harder that shadow is. The further apart they get, the more soft and dispersed the shadow becomes. This helps to show the distance and depth between the objects and helps us to create levels in our scenes. Now all of these theories are very important to help take your coloring from flat to realistic and will help to add so much more dimension to your coloring. Don't worry if this feels overwhelming at first though. When we learn new things, this is common, but the more you go over it, listen to it and practice it, the more it will sink in and make sense. 
So now let's take a look at our image and think about everything that we've just talked about. So if I pick this little pink tulip here to start with, you can see that we have overlapping petals and we can see that by looking at the outline of the petals. I can see that this one here comes straight across and it's uninterrupted. This line just continues around, which means that this is actually sitting on front of what's directly adjacent to it. Now, because this petal is in front, you'll notice here I've added a nice deep dark shadow straight around. And that again helps us to show those levels so we can clearly see which petals are in front and which are further back. Same with this petal on this side as well. We've got a nice big car shadow around that one showing too that this one is sitting forward. So this petal here in the middle that is further back, that has a lot more of the darker shadow tones on it. We've got these tiny little petals at the back here as well. They're on the other side of the tulip. So again, we grab that darkest color and add it all in between those petals so we can show that these are sitting further back in the distance. Now you will see I've created a few little detail lines on the petals. Now these little lines here, I'm treating them like little creases in the petal. Now when we have a crease, notice here my hands close together, I'm creating that crease shape. And notice how that, blocks the light. So between my hands, it's actually quite dark where they join together. And up here, as we extend further up and pop out, that's where it gets lighter because that's where our light hits. So remember the parts of the object popping out towards you are going to appear lighter. The parts curving in or down away from that light are going to be darker. So these little lines on the petals, we think of them like those creases. Wherever we add that darker color, it's going to look like a crease sitting further back from us. Now on your actual stamp, I've added in the very bottom of some of these little texture lines. That way you can use these as a guideline for where to add in some of your own texture and start playing with these creases like we've talked about. But whenever you do have a stamp, you get to create your own mark. So if you feel like you want more detail, more texture, you can absolutely do that. And I've only added the bottom lines as well, so you can practice extending these forward and really creating that detail yourself on the image. Okay, so let's go ahead and actually start our coloring here. Okay, so I've got my uncolored image all ready to go. And I mentioned before that I'd be using the new Couture Creations alcohol ink markers. So I thought I'd just give you a really quick look at them and the basic blending just before we jumped in onto the project. Now these ones here have been ergonomically designed. What I have found is they've got like a like a triangular shaped barrel. And if you do suffer with arthritis or holding a smaller marker or a pencil, these are really nice because they are a bit thicker. So you've increased the circumference of what you are holding and you do have the little grips where your hand can sort of rest on the surface of the marker. So it's a little bit nicer if you don't like having your hand in a cramped position. Now, unlike Copic, if you've used Copic before, usually the side with the little gray bit is where your brush is. This is the opposite. So that will be your bullet tip end. And I'll just show you that there. You can see you've got the little bullet tip. Look, to be honest, I don't use this side because this side here actually has a circumference. So bullet tips will always end up with a thicker line than a brush tip. However, that is with practice, of course. So at the moment, you may find it easier to get a finer point with your bullet if you haven't had a lot of practice with the brush. Though I really, really encourage you to practice with your brush tip because the only way that that gets easier is with that practice. Now the brush tip is really nice because that comes to an actual point. And that's why that will always be finer for you. So you can see there it actually comes to that uh, point. They are a nice thick brush, so you can really get through um, big backgrounds and areas quickly as well. Now, I'm just going to show you on the bottom of my paper, and I'm using Express It Blending Card here with my uh, markers. It is my favorite mar alcohol marker paper. There's many different brands available, though, and we do list a big variety on our website under the Coloring FAQs page. So that's at kidandcloud.com, and then go to Coloring FAQs, and there's a big write-up on papers. Now, if you're not sure how to make blends, we also do have a write-up on our website. I'll pop up some of my favorite blends with these markers as well. But essentially, I'm just starting with my darkest color, which here is 218. And I'm just popping through 
and doing a nice big thick stroke. Now I'm going to hold the marker as if I was writing with it and I want to use that side edge so I get nice big broad strokes. And you can see I'm slightly lifting at the end so we get that soft finish. Next color that I'm going to come in and use is 211 light pink. And all we do is we just come straight over the top and extend a little further. So you can see we're able to blend that out by applying multiple layers on the page. Next color, a little bit of 230, and we're just doing the same thing. And you can see the colors just blend really nicely, really nice and rich inks on the page as well. And then my 1895. And that's how we do a color blend. So we just blended from dark to light. So we've got the shadow here as our darkest color, like we talked about before. The lightest part here being the highlight and our mid-tone in the middle. So you can see when we create a blend, we've just incorporated everything that we just talked about with light source to help us make that. If this is a little confusing for you and you're new to um, alcohol markers, take a look at our alcohol marker video tutorial, which explains how light source works and how we choose our marker colors to suit the highlight, midtone, and shadow. Now, the only little thing I will note about these markers is they don't actually have a proper numbering system. So the numbers may not make a lot of sense um, logically if you do come from, say, a Copic user. They do have names you can use as well, which might be an easier system of learning. I'll make sure that I note both in, in the description below the video. All right, let's get ready to go ahead and jump in on the coloring. So I am going to start with that darkest color like we just talked about. So it's going to be my 218. And I'm going to make sure that I add this firstly to all of my cast shadow areas. Cast shadow is always great to add first because that way we know exactly where those levels are and we don't forget them as we continue. So I'm just going to come down the side of the petal just like we talked about. Now when you have new markers, I always like to double uncap. So I uncap both ends. That just prevents any blobs from happening or any splatters. Now these markers are quite inky, so I do recommend to uncap away from your work so you don't get any splatters on the page as well. So I'm going to come down the side of the petal here, making a nice car shadow. You can see I'm holding the marker nice and close to the nib, which does give me a little bit more control on the marker. Now we also have the car shadows on the petals at the back there as well. And we've got a cast shadow around our butterfly. So think not just the flower itself, but are there any external elements sitting above our flower? And this little flower here too pops out in front. So we've got that cast shadow behind. Now my cast shadows are not super fine. You can have thickness here. It's a lot easier to blend out if you do. We're going to come in now and add a few detail lines on the tulip. So those little creases that we talked about before. And you can see some of my guides at the bottom here. So you can add as many or few of those detail lines as you like. And I essentially am just coming straight around. And I usually pull mine up a little bit further than where the artist drawn line stops. Same on the side as well. So you're just bringing them up just a touch. And we can do a few through the center too. So you can do as many or few of these little lines as you're comfortable with. Okay, now once you've done that, we can get ready to go ahead and blend out. So the next color that I'm going to be using is my 211. And I'm just going to pop straight in over the top of what I've just done. And I'm extending a little further into the main part of the tulip. So we're gradually filling the space. Now apply multiple strokes so you blend out the line of that color underneath. If you're using good bleed proof cardstock, you can hold the layers of ink and that's what allows you to really blend the color. Don't forget around the side here and where your butterfly is as well. And once you've done that, we can blend out these detail lines. Now I'm blending out toward my left on this left petal. And you can see I'm really extending that up a lot further now so I can create that detail. Now you'll notice in the top we've got a few little dents in our outline. Now we usually don't have a dent in the outline without something happening in the interior. So whenever you have a bump in toward the middle of your object, think of that being pulled in and down. So we've got that bump there and that bump's happening 
from a pool in the center. So still using that 211, I'm going to draw that little bump down. So it doesn't have to be very big. This one here, you can see I've actually drawn the line to indicate that. So you can extend that down as well. So we're starting to create almost like an undulating effect in uh, the top of the petal as well. You can do a few on the little side here. So same thing, whenever we have that bump in toward the center, use that as a guide. So always use what's happening in the outline of your images as a guide to what's going to happen on the inside. Little bumps and lumps are indicators of detail. can do some in these outer petals as well if you do have them. Okay, now the next color I'm going to be using is 230, that is my pink. So it's the same thing, going straight over the top. And we're just extending all these little lines now, even the little details that you just did. And then we've got 1895 baby pink, and this is where everything joins up. Now where we have the absolute lightest parts of the fold, I try and keep just a little slither of white. That really just helps the high points to really stand out and gives you a little bit more contrast in the blend. So you can see there's not big pockets of white, there's just these tiny little spots there, which really just help your little detail lines to really stand off the page. Don't worry if you don't quite get them today. It is something that you have to work toward. So you may find at the moment you're a little heavy handed with your blend. That is absolutely very normal for beginners and people starting out and getting that market control. It's only with practice that we really get that a little bit uh, nicer. So aim towards leaving the white, but don't get too upset if you don't quite get there. Now in the first round of the blend, what I notice is that my colors tend to end up desaturated. So what that means is that we just added our darker color in the shadows. And then to blend that out, we basically come through with lighter colored alcohol each time to dilute down that darker color. So that's actually how we do our blending. We're essentially diluting down darker alcohol with lighter colored alcohol, just in small increments, which is what gets that smoothness. Now the problem with that is sometimes when we do the first layer of the blend, that darker color really does get diluted down that we don't see a lot of that detail. So to combat that, we can actually come through and repeat everything again to build up a little bit of extra depth. Now this is of course optional. Everyone colors a little bit differently and you may be really happy with where it is right now. So I'll leave it up to you if you do want to do the extra coat, but personally I really like to come in and do this. So I grab my 218 again and I'm literally just doing the same thing again on the page. So I'm laying this exactly where I did the first time around. Now if your blend is really light, you can even thicken up the darker color this time around. And that way you can play with how dark the blend is overall. Okay, now once you're happy with that, we can go into the next color, which is going to be my 211. And we're just working on blending that out now. So it's literally, again, the same thing. So we apply the 211 straight over the top, multiple soft strokes just to start blending it out. You can even add that detail from the top. Now you may be wondering why I didn't use the darker color in these top sections. 
That's because at the bottom of the flower, this part is really quite far down from the light. It's fully curved away. Our light's coming from above, so it's not hitting that bottom section. Whereas it does hit the tops of these petals. So my shadows at the very top, I've just kept them just a touch lighter so we can really show the difference in the levels here. All right, next color that I'm going to be using is a little bit of 230, my pink. Continuing to blend out. And then my 1895 baby pink. All right, now that's my first flower all done. So now we can use the same technique to essentially color the rest of the tulips. So I'm going to go ahead now and color up this little yellow one to the side. Now just bring back my finished image just so we can take a look at what's happening in terms of the light there. So in this one here we can see we've got the same sort of thing that happened in our previous tulip we have the petal in the middle which is sitting behind the two on the sides and we can see that by just the way that these outline edges just come over and you can see here straight over the top and past that middle tulip, uh, petal there and same on the side the outline comes straight over the top and just extends out past so if we look at the outline the outline for the middle petal it just stops at these two points so if we start to think in terms of three dimension, we want to think about why does that line stop? What's actually happening? These petal lines are continuing underneath and the whole way back to that bottom. Same on this side. So because we can't see those lines, it doesn't mean they're not there. They're just behind. So again, behind means the shadow falls on top. So that's why we have our nice thick car shadows straight here and here. These petals at the back, same thing, nice big car shadows all around them because they are further back. And then we have our detail lines. Now notice here that I've got the two lines in like a V shape and I've left the middle of that V shape light. This is a really nice way to really get that contrast to show those levels because the lighter parts you can see look like they're popping out toward us. Whereas these two darker lines looks like they're sort of curving down and away from that high point. So that's a really easy way to create dimension on your flowers as well as do a little V shape and shade away from the center. And you can see I've done that twice there. If you're still learning your fine lines, you may just aim to do one V shape through the middle. Just remember whenever you do a class or lesson, you don't always have to get the same level of detail that I'm getting in my work. It's all about just adapting to suit where you're currently at in your journey. So even if you do less detail, it's still going to look really great and like you've paid attention to all the lights or series and everything we've been going through. It just means that you're working up to that market control, but we have to practice it and we have to push through in order for that to become more refined. So let's now go ahead, grab out our markers and we'll color these yellow ones. Now, one thing you can do if you're a little nervous with your coloring is you can start with your lightest color. So what you can do with this lightest color is you can map in all of those little creases, the cast shadows, all of your shadow details before you come back in with the darkest color. This way you can adjust and play with all of those uh, shadows and the details and you can fix any mistakes that you don't love. This way, when you come with a darker marker, you're not even going to be able to see what you do with this lighter color. So I thought I'd show you that now, just as an alternative. So starting with 917, we can come and add in our cast shadows. So just what we talked about before. So you can see this is the lightest color now. Now the reason I don't usually color or teach in light to dark is because it uses more ink in the end result. More ink equals more money. So I like to teach dark to light. Also, it's quicker. Um, so quicker uses less money overall, but it's personal preference. There's nothing wrong with whichever way you want to do this. 
I'm going to come in now and create those v-shapes so remember two if you are comfortable or just one if you're still learning so you can see I've got four lines there total same on this side as well now this these two petals are out to the side so I'm not really going to do a strong V and you can even do some of the texture from the top Few little lines from here as well and a cast shadow under that butterfly okay so that's how you would do the lightest color then once you're happy with that you can basically just come back over the top with the darkest color so this is going to be my 150 my marigold and then I just trace what I've just done so that just makes it easy for me to have a guide Now, if you're new to learning about fine lines, we do have a totally free class called Markers 101 over on the Kid and Clouder website. And that goes through all the different blending strokes. It goes through light source in more detail as well. Um, how to do fine lines, flicking, feathering, all those different blending techniques. Now, the great thing is, is that alcohol markers all use the same technique. So you can really just jump in with this class even if you're new to these brand of markers as well it will still give you all those underlying fundamentals that you need to help you feel comfortable with that result next color 142 and we're just blending out remember these little v shapes were blending away from that center v so you should have the line in the middle lightest and same on this side. So you end up with two little V shapes. I'll pop the link to that free class that I was talking about as well in the description of this video so you can check that out. We cover quite a few different brands in there as well for you. But you can absolutely join in with any of our classes using any brand of markers. And I'll make sure that I include some of the uh, blends from this new brand as well for you. They're just a really nice cost-effective alternative and you can see they, they do blend really nicely and easily. And I know now more than ever, people are looking at cost and trying to save where we can but we still want to enjoy our hobbies and take those breaks for our self-care 106 light yellow is next i think it's hard when there's so much going on in the world and we feel overwhelmed we tend to start putting our self-care last but when we start to actually feel stressed and overwhelmed, that's actually our body telling us that doing a mindful activity is really going to help to lower those stress levels. And that impacts us physically and emotionally as well. So even though coloring may not feel important, it's actually you that's important. It's making sure that we make time for mindful activities to take a break, to recharge and feel more balanced. So whenever you do something like a class, that's considered a mindful activity, not a relaxation activity like your normal coloring is. Next color is my baby yellow 917. So relaxation is kind of like when you zone out and you just sort of forgetting about everything. But a mindful activity is when you are focused on instruction or a little bit of a challenge in front of you. This is forcing you to actually be really present in the moment, which is actually what gives your mind that break because we're now focusing on what's in front. We're not worrying about the past or the future. So we're actually taking that little bit of a time out. And this is why it's so important to make time for both relaxation and mindful activities like this, because it's really just about recharging, feeling a little bit more in control and a little, have a little bit more perspective. So when you do feel overwhelmed with things going on in life, actually say to yourself, okay, now would actually be a great time for 10 minutes of a mindful activity just to step back. If you can start to implement that, you can really see a big change in your stress levels with whatever you're going through. 
So that's my first coat of the yellow done. Now I want a slight two-tone finish here. So I'm going to give a little bit of a play with some reds and at the very bottom. So I've got my 206. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to use a tiny little bit of this color just at the very bottom of the flower. And this is just giving me that slight two-tone finish. Then from here, I'm grabbing my 1895, my baby pink, and I'm just blending out into the yellow. So again, it's just a small amount, but you can see I'm going straight over the top and creating that two-tone look. And then I can grab my 106. That's just my mid-yellow, and I'm just blending that up so the color fades into the yellow that I'd done before. So a really quick and easy way to add that really pretty two-tone look to your florals. It works really nicely when just adding a pop of color to the bottom of a lighter color, and you wanna make sure whatever pop of color you add, you fade that out with a lighter color, and then come back with the color on top. So you can see we added the darkest red, we faded that out with a lighter pink, and then we brought our yellow back over to just blend it all back in. Now using that same blend, let's come up and do the flower at the top here. Now this one is more of an open tulip, so you can see rather than coming in, we're going out. We've got a few of these little parts here. Now what that is indicating is that the petal is curving back in on itself like this. So essentially now we have two parts of the petal. We've got the main part and we've got the part that's curved back. Now this part that's on top is we're going to treat that like a separate object. So because that's on top of the main part, we're going to get that nice cast shadow straight underneath. And you can even see that on my hand there. So if I bring back my original, you can see cast shadow straight under any of those lips that are sitting in front. And then we have our usual cast shadows between each of the petals to break it down as well. So just popping that off to the side. Let's now just move on with our darkest color. So you don't have to use that lightest color if you don't want. If you're a little nervous, you're more than welcome to use it. So I've got my 150 and I'm just coming in and around the petals that are in front. So I'm going ahead and doing my cast shadows at the moment. Don't forget to come around any lips as well. So I even like to come through and just do all of my cast shadows at once and then come back and do the detail over the top at the end. That way it's nice and clear, you don't forget your cast shadow step. Okay, so you can see there, oops, I forgot a little cast shadow under that main part there, that main lip. Now once I've done all of them, I can go back and add in my detail, so my little texture lines. So you can start from the bottom, just have a look and see if there's any spots to add in the detail line. I've got a little bit here, I might do a little bit on this side. And you can do a little bit coming down from these top sections. All right, now once you're happy with that, we're going to blend out with my next color, which is going to be 142. We're just going to come straight over the top and extending that a little further out. Now you can come over the back of this top lip as well, that back lip would be curving around from the light. So it's going to be a little darker on the back side, but I don't use my very darkest color there.
106 light yellow is next and we're continuing to blend out now what you'll notice this flower here is a little darker or richer than the bottom one even though it's the same blend now we can control the value of the blend by how much or how little of each color we use now value is how light or dark a color blend is and you can see this flower here being a little bit darker means that I've used more of that darker color to create the blend versus the lighter color. So that's how I've got that control and that richer look. So if you're ever doing a color and you think, hmm, my blend looks a little bit too dark, you probably just use a little bit more of the darker colors versus the lighter. Now that doesn't mean anything is wrong, especially with florals. Everything comes in all different colors. There's no one right way to do things and a class is always just a guide but if you ever want to learn how to control that just play around with how much or little of each color you're using on the page 917 baby yellow is next and i'm just finishing now when you get to the high point of those folds if you can leave that little slither of white it'll just help them to really pop out for you notice that the top lips are generally a lot lighter than the main part of the flower as well now, if you want to do that little peak of the two-tone color, you absolutely can. So I'm going to come in with the 206, and I'm just going to apply this at the very bottom here. So you can see I'm not actually applying a lot of this color, and I'm coming straight over the yellow that I did lay down. And then I'm going to blend it out. So the next color is 1895 baby pink. And I'm just extending that up a little further. So overlapping the colors, getting it smooth. And then you can blend that out with a touch of the yellow as well. So I'm going to use my 106 light yellow. And then I'll just morph that straight into the mid-tone of my yellow colors and that gives me that really pretty subtle two-tone look all right getting there now i've got one more pink flower i'm going to do at the top so let's go ahead and do that before i get too far along i'm going to start with a little bit of my 218 and we're just going to lay in all of our cast shadows just like we've been doing throughout so just coming around so you can see once you start thinking about those light source series and you've done a couple it just starts to make a little bit more sense now this little part here that's curving in front make sure we do a car shadow under that so we can show that change in level any detail you want at the bottom to show those little creases and then we blend out and actually before I move on I'm just going to do on the other side we've got a little bud I'm going to do this in the same blend so I'm just doing a cast shadow around the leaves and I split that in half next color is a little bit of 211 230 and then 1895 leave that little slither of white if you can Now you can come back and repeat everything if you do want to build up a little bit of extra depth as well. Now I've got my last tulip here. I'm going to come through first and do the center with 106 light yellow. And I'm just going to dab this on these little central parts. And then I'm going to do my reds and rounds. So I'm starting with a little bit of 220. 
Now, you want to come through and do a little bit of a cast shadow underneath these. Now, these are kind of small, so just do what you're comfortable with. But we're just trying to fill a little bit of that space around, which will help these to really stand out as well. Once you've done that, you can come through and do your cast shadows as normal between each of the petals. So you may even want to come around the top as well here. And from there, you can do some of those detail lines up. Use some of those lines that have already been drawn in for you as a guide that takes a lot of the scariness away. Now this one here, we're seeing the inside of the petal and then that's the part that's curving back around. So let's just add some shading to that reverse side. This one here coming through from underneath, so it's going to be a lot darker where it sits beneath the two other petals. Same on this side as well, like you're seeing that bottom part there and a nice big thick car shadow around. Now this one, we're seeing that reverse side, so darkest at the bottom here. And because that's like the top part, so that's going to be the lightest. All right, now let's blend that out. The next color I'm going to be using is 187. So we're going to come straight over the top and then extend a little further out. Now you can add a few little details from the top if you want to extend those creases through. Remember a nice fine line will help to really create that definition. And you can extend towards some of those detail lines at the bottom as well. Next color is a little bit of 206. Seventeen seventy-five. so we're getting a lot lighter as we get toward our highlight areas now. Even when an object is really rich, we still want to make sure that we have contrast in the color. We still want to see the difference between light and shade. That's what helps the objects to have depth. And I'm going to finish with a touch of 1895, so even lighter again, just to bring us to that very highlight area.
All right, now that's the red flower done. So all of our flowers are actually done now. Now we're gonna come through and do the leaf detail. So I'm gonna use a really nice yellow green blend for this. And we're gonna start with a little bit of 7743. Now there's a lot of leaves going on here, so it's really important that we take the time to establish our cast shadows. So we really wanna look at what's in front, what's behind. Now you can see there's a lot of finer lines. These are just your details in the uh, leaf, the veins in the leaf. So we don't wanna use our very darkest color on them because that'll indicate that these creases are the same depth and level as your car shadow. So we'll reserve this for a lighter color. Use this color to just do your car shadows between. That's really going to help to show each individual leaf and it'll be a lot clearer for us. Now don't forget if a leaf is curving back on itself, we're going to have a car shadow there as well. So with every twist, you have a car shadow on the part that's now behind. You'll have a car shadow beneath any flowers, but don't add it in where you've got white space. So just try and be aware of what you are coloring. If you do accidentally do this, don't worry though. Make it part of your image and no one will know but you. We also want to do a shadow behind the basket because that's sitting forward of all the leaves too. All right, now once you've done that, we can start to blend out. So the next color I'm going to be using is my 358. And I'm just going to come straight over the top of what I've just done and start to blend that out. So again, the same thing we've already been talking about with our light source. Nice and easy, we're just following our basic shapes. And it's really easy, once you add in those shadows, we're just continuing up from that point to fill it all in. Now when the leaf comes out a bit on the horizontal like this, we apply a bit more of the shading to the lower side because we're wanting to show uh, that that's further down from the light with our light coming from above too. Now light source is one of those things that just takes a lot of time and practice to learn. So again, if this is new to you, it's totally normal that that feels maybe a little bit overwhelming or you still don't really quite understand. The way we learn light source is just by actually coloring and doing our lessons, going over and over the different theories again and again, trying all different objects, forms. That's what makes it become second nature. So make sure if you love florals that you don't just stick to floral classes though. I see this a lot and I always get the same complaints from these people. They say, I, I only like coloring flowers, but I don't feel like I'm growing a lot. And they end up kind of stunting their growth a little bit because they're sticking to only the same topics and what's comfortable. It only gives us a really limited understanding and 
if you wanted to do like a cool effect or a color or something a little different, you're not going to have that knowledge and, and the ability to really play because you haven't yet done that with other images. And I find also a lot of flower images have extra things like here we've got the basket, some have a little bit of metal or some might have a, a timber tabletop. Doing other images gives you the skills to be able to tackle any extras in your favorite images as well. So don't just stick with the one type and think that that's going to teach you all you need to know to get to where you want to be. You really do have to experiment and go out of your comfort zone and try the different things in order for your coloring to progress, even if all you want to color in the end is your flowers. Next color is my 354. I think a lot of the times people forget that when you do a class, it's not just a quick tutorial, it's actually an educational lesson. So it's all about really learning and growing your skills and abilities. And that's why it is challenging. And that's why it's actually important to have a challenge, because if it was going to be super easy, you're not really growing and learning a whole lot, which is defeating the purpose a little. So this today is more of a proper art lesson. And if you're new to our classes, this is just a small one. I'm not taking you too in depth today, uh, but you can see like we're starting to break down proper techniques to help you really start adding that depth and dimension back into your work. So in our main classes, you can expect that I'm really going to be taking this a lot further for you, really going through a lot of the ins and outs, but just at this level. So I'm not making it any harder. We're breaking it down still nice and easily, but we are going through and teaching you more of those ins and outs, the whys, and hopefully giving you that challenge so you are leveling up. Next color is 2288. And this color is our lightest one, so we're going to bring it through. Now, if you can leave that slither of white just at the highest point, please do. It'll help to increase your contrast and make everything stand out even more. Now, a lot of these techniques can be applied to all different images as well. So if you've picked up some of the other stamps in the collection, the leaves can be exactly the same. The flowers can be approached in the same way as well. And you're just adapting what you've learned in this lesson to your other images. So it's always helping you to level up for other images as well, not just what we're coloring here today. That's why learning those theories is so important. Now, don't forget at the end here, you can repeat the steps if you want to build up that little bit of extra depth as well throughout the leaves. But what I'm going to do is I've got my 358, and I'm actually going to come through and apply this to my vein lines here now so I can create a little bit of that texture, but it's not as dark as my very shadows. So you can see I'm just coming along these, adding in those really light creases through the surface. just a little bit of texture it's only minimal because I don't want it to take over but it's just showing that we have that movement and I'm not just using the artist lines to add in we're really following that through and creating our own detail on the surface 
We're almost finished. We just have our butterfly and our basket left to go. So let's do our butterfly now. I'm going to be using some oranges and then some black to create the pattern work. Okay, so I'm going to start here with 165 orange and I'm just going to apply just roughly, does not need to be perfect, just at the edges of this interior part. Next color is a little bit of 173 golden. And again, I'm extending in a short way. It's just a little bit messy. I want to actually see a bit of color variation. Next color is a little bit of 142. So I'm going from the oranges down to my yellow tones now. And again, don't worry about it being perfect here. And then a little bit of 106. Now you can repeat if you want a little bit of extra depth as well. Okay, now once you're finished, we're going to use our black marker to create the detail. So I'm actually going to come in here with the black, so 006. And I'm just going through and coming along the outer edges. Now you can even fill this in as well, so it's nice and thick. So you don't need super fine lines to do this step. And then from here, what we're going to do, we're going to split the two wings and then I'm going to draw like a curving shape up. So I've got a little curve and then from that curve, I'm going to extend my strokes back. And then I'm going to do the same in the bottom, but now I'm going to curve down in the other direction and then our strokes are going to come in to meet that. Now let's do the same on the other side. Now we're going to curve up toward the top and then our strokes are going to come in to meet it. And then I'm going to curve down toward the bottom and again have your strokes come in to meet. And come through the body of the butterfly as well. You can just do little stripes and if you can do your fine line to do the antenna you can bring that up too. Now for the detail, I'm going to be using a white gel pen. Now I've just got a Uniball Signo gel pen here. You can use any brand at all. And I'm just going to come down the edges and I'm going to do some large dots to fill in the space. So this will create some of the more traditional markings of the butterfly. And you can even do some in the body as well. Okay, almost done. We just have the basket left. So come down to the bottom. Now you can see here a lot of overlapping elements. So what do we need to incorporate? Our cast shadows. So I'm going to start with my darkest color, my 479, and we're going to do our cast shadows. Now you can see we've got two different types of weave here. So what we actually have is a horizontal one. You can see here that this one going horizontal, this one's going down the vertical. So we've got horizontal, vertical, horizontal, vertical. Now when we have the horizontal ones, our cast shadows are going to sit on the insides next to those verticals because you can see there it's curving back 
in next to that vertical shape. So that's our little curve. Then on our vertical ones, our shadows are actually going to be top and bottom. So it changes a little bit. Now you don't need to connect these, but we're just going to come through and just differentiate between the horizontal and the verticals. And then you can see it changes. So now on this one here, we have a vertical. So I'm going to do my vertical down and then I've got a horizontal and then a vertical and then the horizontal. So we're just going back and forth, basically adding these in. Come under that top lip And then around this top edge. Now in the top, what we're going to do here is we're going to extend a few little detail lines out to the side. Just sort of showing where this is bunched up a little bit. Make your car shadow nice and thick underneath that top ledge as well so we can really see the difference between them. All right, next color that I'm going to be using is a little bit of 7565. That is my caramel. We're going to come over the cast shadow firstly, and then we're just going over each of these little shades, but blending in toward the respective part that you're doing your shading on. Don't worry if it feels confusing, just do your best. We're basically just doing a basic blend in each of these shapes first. And then you can also apply through this top section as well. All right, next color is going to be 7507. And we're just continuing that blend out. So adding more of those caramel colors, this is warm gold. And again, you're blending in toward that center. Bring it in considerably now. We've only got one more color left in the blend. And now a little bit of 155. Nice and light, and this is just going to cap it all off for us. Now with this color, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back and I'm going to draw now some of the detail lines. So I'm going to be using 7565. 
and I'm actually going to draw my lines in the direction of each of these. So I'm going to come up from the base here and draw my lines. You can see this is a vertical section. And then we've got our horizontal section. Now my big aim here is I just don't want my lines to join in the center. I'm just creating the texture. Now it's really important that you space out your strokes and leave a gap between them. That's what will make the texture nice and visible for you. So remember always alternating between the vertical and horizontal lines. So if you've just done horizontal, then the next one's vertical. And that's what's going to really help you get that woven look. And now I'm going to grab my 7505 and I'm just going to do the same thing, but now I'm joining a lot of the strokes through that center. Make sure that you still separate them by leaving a gap between them though. That'll make the texture a lot more prominent. that is actually the basket all done but not only that our image is actually all done now as well so just zooming out so you can take a look at that finished result so we've learned a lot of techniques in this lesson here today um, going through a lot of light source a lot of texture a lot of color theory as well to color up our new stamp here now remember, you can try this technique with absolutely any image at all and with any color blend as well to help you start implementing some of these art theories that we've gone through. Remember, coloring takes time and practice to learn though, so your results may not be instantly the same as mine or others that you may see, but the more you practice, the easier it gets. Always make sure to take the challenge. Don't say to yourself, oh, maybe I'm not ready for that yet. Make yourself be ready now. That's the way to, that we learn and improve. You are ready right now to take those next steps. Even if you don't love the result that you've actually colored here today or you've made mistakes, it's a lesson that you learn from and you've still grown from that. So give yourself a pat on the back for taking that next step. Now, if you'd like to view our stamps, where to buy them from, where to check out the rest of our coloring classes or coloring FAQ information, you'll find all of these details in the description below the video as well. So thank you so much for watching and I really hope you've enjoyed this mini lesson and I can't wait to see your coloring of our new stamp and color range. Thanks so much for watching and see you next time.